Yeah, good evening. I'm Stuart Brand from Long Now. The speaker's going to talk about the difference between price and value. And I think in terms of Long Now, one of the differences between price and value is time. Uh, price in a volatile market is this instantaneous erratic thing, uh, doesn't hold still, whereas value is something more durable. So if the speaker is talking about rethinking markets in terms of value, she's thinking markets in terms of in a more long nowish way. Please welcome the lady in red, Mariana Mazzucato. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. Is this on? Yes. I was actually going to wear white, but I was told not to. So I put on this great red dress, and then I had to put on this microphone, which was impossible. So I had to lift up the dress, but I didn't do it here. I did it in the back, which was all good. <laughs> anyway, um, so that was a really interesting video. If I write on this piece of paper, I owe Stuart five pounds, and it's backed by government. This is money. And it's very interesting, the whole question of what is money and do we have limits? Do we actually need taxation to go to war? Um, there's a huge debate about that right now in the US and I'm not going to talk about this. I'm actually going to talk about what we need to do to revive a real discussion, a serious discussion about how to reform capitalism, which has gone wrong. And I'm not the first person who will tell you that it's gone wrong, but to really bring back a serious debate where then the walk is as serious as the talk in terms of also rethinking value chains inside companies so we don't just rely on, for example, philanthropic giving or different ways to patch up the system. Um, and it's a really interesting time to be talking about this because there's this desire, if one can call it that, in both business and in politics to refine purpose in the economy. So this was a, a famous letter that Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, wrote to 500 CEOs uh, last year, 2018, basically saying, we've screwed up. We are, you know, we've lost our way. We're no longer investing back in the workforce. We are, we've become too short-termist, just worried about our quarterly returns. We've got to change. Um, and the same kind of discussions are being had basically both on the right of the political spectrum and the left. So in the UK, where I'm coming from, there was Ed Miliband when he was the head of the Labour Party. He talked about the need for a more responsible type of capitalism and actually was quite specific. And he used some words that I'm going to be using tonight. He said, we need a more productive form of capitalism, less unproductive, but also, you know, what kind of productive? What are we actually producing? Are we uh, reaching a more sustainable and inclusive form of capitalism or less so? But this whole debate about productive versus unproductive, value, wealth creation, and really the admission that economic growth has not just a rate but a direction and that we need to bring that issue of directionality to the fore is the opportunity that we have tonight and you know, hopefully over the next, next decade to actually reach, for example, these amazing goals that uh, countries around the world have set themselves, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. These are recent. We have never had a period in history where countries agreed on a set of goals like that. But again, what does it mean to actually transform business practices, transform how governments uh, work, how their instruments behave, both the money creation, but also things like procurement and grants, um, how labor unions interact with capital, capital labor relations. All this is really important because markets, right, the word the market, capitalism and the market, markets are outcomes. We often confuse the word market with business. Markets are outcomes of how business, different types of businesses, small, medium, and large, uh, different types of public entities, different types of third sector entities, including trade unions and philanthropies, interact, but also how they're themselves governed within their organizations. And this is sort of the call that I want to make tonight, that we really have to get serious about the internal governance of the different institutions, which, uh, through their interactions, form the kind of capitalism that we have. And it's no good just to talk about climate change or inequality if we're not serious about these kinds of changes that are absolutely required in the governance structures. And this call for purpose, which we keep hearing about, unfortunately, not much is changing. And I think because we're not going deep into uh, the governance of these organizations. And I want to do so by actually talking about value. 
because I fundamentally think that value is actually created collectively, and looking at how different organizations collectively interact, um, often problematically, but also how they're governed problematically, I think has to be the center of how we think about reforming capitalism. Now, before doing that, I want to depress you just a bit, um, basically just to remind you how bad things are and how little things have actually changed since one of the biggest uh, crises of all time, the second biggest financial crisis, really, the one that... Um, began in 2007, 2008. And so I'm going to just very quickly depress you a bit, but I promise I will get to hopeful, positive things towards the end, and we have a huge amount of time. Um, so four big, fat problems. The first I'll call the financial problem, the finance problem. And this is really what I mean by this, is the problem within the financial sector. And I'm going to be a bit superficial here, because I'm going to go through lots of both economic thinking and also economic history. But um, what I mean by this is a kind of financialization of finance. In other words, finance is financing finance. Um, and what you see here in this curve, this is for uh, the UK economy, but the US economy looks quite similar, the degree to which the financial sector has outpaced in its size uh, the rest of the economy. So this is looking at financial intermediation, which is basically banks, but also the whole shadow banking system and all forms of different types of financial institutions growing much faster than the rest of the economy. And basically this is because so much of the financial sector has ended up just financing finance, insurance, and real estate, which conveniently the acronym is Fire. Um, and so, you know, this often makes people think, oh God, this is terrible. We need to kind of definancialize and kind of fuel industry, right? So, this is also why in some countries industrial policy has come back and the idea that we need to kind of fuel the makers. So, these are the takers. And unfortunately, this brings me to the second problem, which is that industry has become very financialized <laughs> itself. And by that, I mean that increasingly in many large companies, and this is data here for um, uh, 466 of the S&P 500 companies, uh, the profits being earned are not actually being reinvested back into production, back into the workforce, human capital and skill, research and development, but used for exactly the kind of things that Larry Fink was, in theory, in theory, warning about. So things like share buybacks. And so this data here shows you that between 2008, so after the financial crisis, to 2017, these 466 big companies uh, spent over well, four, tri uh, four trillion dollars uh, in share buybacks, which was equivalent to 53% of their profits, along with 3.1 trillion as dividends. And this would be fine as long as they were also, you know, again reinvesting back in. But that yellow bit there, which is the reinvestment back into production, um, including skills, uh, has been falling. And you see this, by the way, also at the macroeconomic level. You might know that GDP, gross domestic product, which is how we measure output of the economy, can be broken down in different ways. One of it is on the spending of all the different components of the economy. So government spending, G, business spending, I, consumption spending, and net exports. And the I part, business investment, has been falling. And this is not uh, a coincidence, right? This is precisely because there hasn't been that reinvestment. I'm just going to say one thing, because I often forget to say it. And apologies if I often do these little parentheses. But this is a huge problem. <laughs> and this basically is you know, much more of a problem than the so-called the robots are taking our jobs. It's very interesting if you look back at the history of economic thought, and I'll be going through quite a bit of history uh, in just a minute. David Ricardo, one of the first economists ever in 1821, wrote a book called Principles of Political Economy. And chapter 31, don't ask me how I remember these details, I can't remember what I did this morning, but chapter 31 of this book that he wrote in 1821 called On Machinery, he warned that this rise in machines were displacing labor, and he was very worried about the effect that the rise of the machines, today's robots, would be having on employment and wages. But what we ended up having for basically 200 years, and it kind of stopped around the 1980s and onwards, was that as long as profits were being reinvested back into the economy, kind of didn't matter. Machines, yes, took jobs in one part of the economy, but as long as profits were invested, they reappeared in other places. And skills were also formed as an endogenous function of that investment process, right? Skills don't only come from workers, uh, sorry, from government training programs. They also come from if you're kind of taken care of inside the company, if you're invested in. Um, and this is just really important because there's so much talk today about the future of work and the robots, what's gonna happen without actually putting these numbers and this data 
at the center of the picture as just as important to confront, and this is a corporate governance problem. So this was problem two, sorry, little distraction there. Uh, problem three is that in a time where we would really need serious, ambitious policy, as ambitious as the kind of policies that got us the welfare state or that got a man to the moon and back again in one generation, we basically have states that have been convinced by, well, unfortunately, by economists, uh, we unfortunately have lots of influence, that at best they can just kind of tinker on the sidelines. You always have to first identify the market failure, and then you're allowed to do something, and this kind of leads to this very patchy view of what policy is for. So in a moment where we're calling for things like a green transition, um, and I'll get to this in a second, the fourth problem is, in fact, climate change, um, when we need to, in theory, we're talking about it, approach the sustainable development goals for real, where we have a, a, a rise in inequality, at least relative inequality in many countries, and there's a talk about reforming capitalism, this idea that you're just there patching up the system and putting band-aids when it goes wrong is simply not going to get us what we need. Um, and it's not that these market failures don't exist. This is the term that economists use, market failures, and you always have to identify the market failure before policy does anything. They do exist, so let me just give you some examples here. Uh, when you have positive externalities, so goods that create these really great spillovers, that it's hard to appropriate the returns just for yourself, you will have underinvestment by the private sector in that area, so government comes in and invests in things like basic research. Uh, the opposite, when businesses are producing too much of something that is not good, a negative externality, then government comes in and does something like a carbon tax. Uh, when you have asymmetric information, so cute little companies don't get enough money because the, the banks don't actually know anything about them because they don't have enough history, then you might need government to come in and do SME lending. So again, all these things you know, happen and, and this framework isn't completely useless. But in a time where there's at least talk about rediscovering purpose and reforming capitalism and rethinking the direction, not just the rate, these tools are part of the problem. And fourth, as I just kind of gave it away before, the climate problem. This is kind of the problem. If we don't sort this, everything else is kind of irrelevant. Um, we've got 12 years left, the IPCC report, if you haven't read it, read it. Uh, Greta, young woman, reminds us that our house is literally on Fire, second time I use the word fire. Interesting, you can use it both for climate change and the financial uh, sector. It's probably not a coincidence. Um, and, you know, and unfortunately, it's not just that there's not enough spending on renewable energy. This also is data from the IPCC. So apparently we're only spending about 20% of what we should be in terms of really getting a renewable energy revolution going. But green is not just about renewable energy. It's really about transforming how our economies work. So getting some old manufacturing sectors to reduce their material content. And the history of capitalism, we've often required real kind of bold demand side policies, not just that supply push, and we're not getting those. Um, okay, so that's the depressing bit. Four massive problems, which kind of is why we need to rethink. If we don't have those problems, who cares? We could be talking about something else. So what I did in my book, uh, The Value of Everything, was to kind of bring it down to first principles and ask, could it be that also we've just kind of lost our way and stop really debating something that actually in the course of the last kind of 200 years of thinking about the economy was really central. This question of, you know, what is value? What is value creation? What is value extraction? And what happens when we, either by, mis by mistake or on purpose, end up rewarding value extraction more than value creation. Do we get something called value destruction? But, you know, I, I just keep using that word value there, but what is value? Um, and notice, by the way, that the subtitle is not makers versus takers, because that's really static. That would lead to the rest of my 40 minutes here kind of making a list of big, bad finance, hedge funds, credit default swaps, bad, and then kind of saying that something else is good. That's not what I'm going to do. I say, making and taking, the reason I chose that kind of verb is that we can change things. We can, and I hope perhaps we can talk about it also um, in the Q&A, um, we can fundamentally reform how finance is operating and how certain business practices have kind of gone astray and how government has just become a bit too lame. Um, but what's really interesting is that this kind of concept of making and taking kind of often comes back after every financial crisis. So I, I pulled out this quote here, which is 
very nice one by Big Bill Haywood, um, the first industrial trade unionist in the US, writing at the time of the Great Crash in 1929. And it's, it's really interesting because you just replace the word gold barons by financial sector, and it kind of rings what a lot of people and communities around the world were saying. So the barbarous gold barons, they didn't find the gold, they didn't mine the gold, they didn't mill the gold, but by some weird magic, alchemy, all the gold belongs to them. Um, and so this is the kind of making and taking, and, and you know, this is kind of the accusation. Um, but so what does this mean? What does it mean to actually think about the economy in terms of certain areas being kind of productive, certain being unproductive, and really thinking about how to make sure we're steering activities inside what I call in the book the production boundary. Um, and unfortunately, what happens when we no longer talk about value and just kind of assume, you know, Silicon Valley is full of wealth creators, we end up allowing stories, literally just stories, and narratives and discourses about value and wealth creation to take over. And what I'm going to basically argue <laughs> is that when that happens, we allow value extraction to be disguised as value creation. And, you know, it's not that the landlords in the 1700s, and I'll get to them in a minute, weren't extracting value, but they didn't pretend to be innovative. They didn't pretend to be value creators. They just said, give me your damn money. And people gave them the money. Adam Smith called uh, landlords thieves. <laughs> um, there was no masquerading. And again, I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm sure there's many uh, tech people here in the room. I'm, I'm not going to start making accusations of, again, whether it's tech or finance or, or, or government officials as value extractors. But this kind of masquerading exercise is a problem. And, you know, there's, I was really struck how one year, just one year after the crisis, the head of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein, said with a completely straight face, it, it, it was not an after dinner speech where he was trying to make people laugh. You know, completely serious, look it up, just Google it, and the FT put this quote, um, that Goldman Sachs workers were the most productive in the world. You know, I mean, this is a period where they had just been bailed out $10 billion by the US government uh, because of what happened with the financial crisis. There was plenty of evidence that it was, in fact, to a large extent, not only the activities of the large investment banks that at least partially <laughs> led to the financial crisis, and yet this bold statement of we are the most productive in the world. And so this whole concept of how do we measure productivity? Do teachers say we are the most productive in the world? And if not, could it be that how we are actually accounting for a value in the system creates actually a self-fulfilling prophecy that it allows some actors in the economy to be very bold and arrogant and, and, and to be able to claim, even just logically, in terms of how we do the counting, that they are so productive. But then again, I, I mentioned story. So this idea that, again, wealth creators in Silicon Valley or in the case of Brexit, when uh, Brexit, I'm still hoping it doesn't happen, but... Um, happened, uh, you know, this idea that we have to at least protect those really valuable uh, 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 sectors which, which were producing value for the UK economy, so financial services. Um, and I'll mention also later the way that the word value is used in sectors like the pharmaceutical industry to justify very high increases in prices. So recently, a price of an antibiotic went up by 400% overnight, and the idea that value-based pricing could somehow be used to uh, justify that is quite extraordinary. And on the opposite spectrum, I've already mentioned teachers. You don't hear teachers calling themselves, we are so productive, but also the state itself, how we talk about the state. We don't talk about it really as creating value. At best, we talk about it as redistributing value or enabling or de-risking the value creators. So these are really just words and narratives and discourses, which are kind of just, I don't want to say bullshit, but just kind of stories, right? Economics is not nuclear physics. And we've allowed, by not actually talking about value, these stories to be out there and almost not even questioned. Um, so I'm going to start questioning it. And to do so, I will have a drink. Um, not a gin and tonic, but water. Mm. So I will go through, again, quickly, and there's always the risk that when you do something too quickly, it's superficial, but it will be fun, um, the history of economic thought uh, for the last 400 years. <laughs> um, so what's interesting is that if you look at the history of economic thought, there was a real correlation between what was actually happening in the economy, in society really, not the economy, 
and how value was talked about. So in the 1600s, this is a period of the ships, you know, crossing the seas and the 1651 Navigation Acts. It was a period which we call mercantilism, where the idea was really that value occurred through exchange. And so there was lots of attention on exchange rates and terms of trade and what kind of trade agreement would be needed. You know, so this is starting to make you think we've gone back to mercantilism, right? And in many ways, Trump has brought us back 400 years, but whatever, I, I, we won't go there. Um, so, um, but what then happened, which was really interesting, in the 1700s and 1800s, that attention left the kind of just pure exchange economy and went to production. And so, um, the physiocrats who were writing in the 1700s, this was a period in which um, you know, it was still basically an agricultural society. It's not surprising. They really believed that value occurred in uh, agriculture and the farm labor itself produced value. And so they basically produced the first spreadsheet ever. Um, and Francois Canet, a Frenchman, did it. And you can see nothing there, so I've made it for you more visible. And they <laughs> uh, divided the economy into these three classes. Farm labor were the productive class. Um, the the uh, merchants, so those selling things, uh, were the, what do they call them? The proprietors. And then he called the landlords the sterile class, right? I mean, this is like real sexual connotation. In, in the sense of the reproduction of the system. So when you have money being siphoned out of the system, go back to my financial uh, graphs before, being siphoned out, that threatened the reproduction of the system. So they did this whole little analysis here, looking at, okay, this amount of, 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 of goods are produced by the farmers, then a certain amount of uh, uh, funds are used just to move that stuff around in terms of exchange and selling the goods um, that were produced by the farmers, and then, however, there were the landlords who were simply charging rent on the land and were basically just moving things around, and they were basically seen as the, the huge problem. Um, let me just go back. Unfortunately, I made my... There we go. Um, and so their real focus there was on the reproduction of the system, but also in terms of increasing the productivity of the land itself. So it was that focus both on how do you increase the productivity of the farms, but also real attention that the funds were not then siphoned out, whether it was to fight the wars or simply the landlords being able to... Um, dress themselves better, and charging money for basically doing very little. In the 1800s, this is a period of the Industrial Revolution, I already mentioned before, 1821, uh, David Ricardo's uh, chapter on, on machinery. It's not surprising that in that period they focused on industrial labor. And the classical economists, you know, there was basically Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx, they all really shared this attention to what I would call the objective conditions of production. Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, was very much focused Hold on, I think I have a nice picture here, on the division of labor itself. So he had this wonderful um, a pin factory example where he looked at, you know, if one guy has to do everything for a pin, at most he's going to make one pin a day, whereas if you divide that task into these 18 different uh, areas, then you actually increase productivity by a drastic degree, so you can actually make 400, sorry, 4,600 pins a day if you increase that division of labor, which increases productivity, which increases growth, which increases the wealth of nations. Um, and he was also very interested, as were Ricardo and Marx, in this notion of productive and unproductive. And it wasn't negative to be unproductive, so Smith also you know, has this great quote where he's like, yeah, well, some of these things that are unproductive are also just kind of fun, right? And you know, going to hear musicians. And I don't think he liked the opera very much, because if you look at this quote, you know, he must have, the night before writing The Wealth of Nations, gone to a really crappy opera, because he's like, and the unproductive are musicians, opera singers, and opera dancers. You know, this whole list, there's three, three categories, buffoons. Um, and all of you, I mean, how many lawyers are in the room, doctors, professors, you know? Anyway, there's no tech here. Um, so, um, and, and so the point was actually in Smith, what's interesting, he literally made a list. He, he did what I said I tried not to do in the book of just makers versus takers. What Marx did was much more refined. In some ways, he was much less deterministic. What he was interested in was, you know, there, there is a capitalist system. He believed it was based on the exploitation of labor. So he was also very interested in what happens when you increase mechanization and machines display slavery, and then the source of, of, um, of profits potentially uh, disappears. And he was very interested, as was David Ricardo, in this whole issue, again, of reinvestment back into the system. And all three of them really hated rent. In fact, how many of you have heard the word free market? <laughs> 
All of you. What is that? It's free from, just yell it out, free from the? Well, yeah, because you've heard me say that before. Tim, you're not supposed to say things that I've told you in my kitchen, or in your kitchen table. Um, free from the state, that's what people think. It's completely not true. For, for Adam Smith, uh, um, the free market was free from rent. They really believed that this was the problem in the system, and for them, um, rent was basically unearned income. It was just some of the actors in the economy just moving stuff around and doing nothing else, and that was a problem because that wouldn't increase on the productivity um, and, um, and, and growth. And so this real focus on the objective conditions of production, which translated for them also into a distribution of the income, so they looked at the distribution of profits, uh, wages, rents, and interest with the real focus on reducing those rents um, was very interesting. And, you know, this attention to the objective conditions included things like class struggle. So to understand wages, they looked at class relationships. Um, now, what happens with neoclassical economics, which is what we have today, which is what is taught all over the world in economics departments, is that the attention moves away from kind of a theory of value and attention to production to actually focusing on prices and using prices to reveal value. It moves away from an attention to the objective conditions of production to a focus on the subjective conditions. So again, really sorry, very superficial here, but you know, uh, it's, it's basically all based on individual decisions. So the assumption that consumers when we go buy stuff, we are maximizing our individual uh, utility, just think of kind of happiness. Um, workers are maximizing their decisions of leisure versus work. Uh, firms are maximizing their profits. And when you look at the interactions between all these individual preferences and decision making, we get supply and demand curves and we get our equilibrium prices, and those prices reveal value. So it's a complete reverse of the logic. Before it was theories of value, whether it's farm labor or industrial labor, which then determined basically a theory of price, and all of a sudden we have a theory of price, which determines value. So what's the implication of this? Class struggle disappears, <laughs> right? So wages are again uh, determined by uh, preferences for leisure versus work, and could go into that a bit more, but I won't. Prices reveal value, so this is why my you know, brother often says to me, if you're so smart, why don't you earn? so much <laughs> as an academic, right? So this idea that somehow, um, you know, this, this link between income and value, which basically is why Blank Fiend was able to say Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive in the world because they earn a shitload of money. And so because prices are revealing value, those, that income is a measure, if you want, of their productivity. Um, and the really interesting thing, this is probably one of the most profound things, is that rent, which you know, people talk about, there's all sorts of books now in inequality that talk about rent, rent is no longer unearned income, as you know, Smith, Ricardo, and Marx talked about, literally people just moving stuff around without doing much, um, but it's simply uh, uncompetitive price, some, some sort of monopoly power, which in theory, once we get rid of the imperfections, can be competed away. Um, and it's not that that's wrong or right, but it's just a, a, a big change in focus from unearned income to lack of competition and some sort of monopoly power that can, in theory, be, uh, again, removed if we get rid of imperfections. So, who cares, <laughs> right? I mean, was this just like really interesting, quick, you know, history of economic thought? No, I'm gonna argue that this really matters. That when we subjectify value, when we put so much attention just to indivi individual decisions, and kind of remove our focus to the objective conditions of production, and by that I mean kind of who's doing what? What risks are, are being taken, for example, if you look at innovation, right? So we are at the hub of, uh, of one of the world's centers of innovation. Well, who's actually doing what across the whole innovation chain? Just, you know, let's document it, whether it's in the pharmaceutical industry, in the tech area. Um, so this real attention, which you might have as a journalist or as a common person, but in economics, we don't really focus on that much anymore. We don't really focus on the division of labor. We don't look at all the different actors that might be required in order to uh, produce value and also looking at how those actions and the actual risks taken in the actual production along, for example, whole value chain is or is not related to the incomes being earned. Is there kind of a mismatch? Rewards being kind of in excess of what's actually being done. Um, 
And this, this again, transformation of the focus on objective to all of a sudden subjective and the arrows going from price to value instead of value to price is precisely what enables Blankfein to say this with a complete straight face and not, as I said, as an after-dinner joke. So why this matters is because it affects so many things. <laughs> it affects how we determine GDP. Um, and by the way, GDP was not meant to be, by the guys who, and it was mainly guys who um, invented it, was not meant to be such an important number that everyone's obsessing about, whether it's going up by 0.01 or down by two or whatever. Kuznets warned, don't use it for that, but we do. But still, how we actually calculate it is very much driven by prices. So I'm going to talk a, a bit about that. Uh, how we look at governance of organizations, and I would argue the lack of debate about corporate governance, because not much is changing. Um, and again, think, uh, warned, but you know, people have been warning about the problem of short-termism for a long time. This is not unrelated to how we measure value. How we price medicines, I already mentioned, you know, when prices go up by 400% overnight and it's somehow justified based on uh, value-based pricing, this is related to this problem. The lack of real, I don't know what to say, transformation or serious debate about what to do with the problems of rents in platform capitalism, I think are also related to this uh, confusion of price with value and the role of the state, you know, one, a, a key issue, which is, you know, if we need serious policy in order to uh, drive the system in new ways and actually really approach that directionality, this problem of, of mismeasuring value and not even knowing how to talk about value creation within the state is a problem. So let me just kind of take these, I'll, I'm gonna go through um, these, again, relatively quickly, but they're all important, so. Why not? So GDP, I mean, this is quite well known. It's quite fun to teach a macroeconomics class, even though I am personally more of a microeconomist. I do economics of innovation, but I used to love, um, one of the first times I did this just to earn some extra money doing my PhD, giving examples to the students of all the crazy things. Like if you marry your cleaner, GDP goes down. Um, if you pollute, GDP goes up. I'll, I'll let you guys figure it out. You can test them in the Q&A if they actually figure it out. Put it in, in the test. <laughs> um, but so, you know, so feminist economists have been arguing for a long time that we are mismeasuring a fundamental attribute in a system, in our system, which is care, the care we give to people at home, to our children, to the elderly, and just because it doesn't have a price, we don't put it into GDP. That's a problem. Environmentalists have been saying, again, it's crazy that when we pollute, GDP doesn't go down, it actually goes up simply because we have to pay for someone to clean it up. That's kind of well known, so I don't have to come here and tell you that. What's less known is coming, you know, bringing this back to finance, the whole financial sector, basically, or most of the financial sector, was not even included in GDP up until about 1970. And this is because, even though they didn't realize they were doing that, they were, the people doing the national accounts were basically accepting the classical idea of rent as unearned income. So the idea that was that most of finance, for example, net interest payments, which was data that we had, wasn't being included in GDP because the idea was that it's just moving stuff around. It's not actually doing much. So what did go into GDP in terms of the financial sector were the fees, for example, that you would be charged by the mortgage provider, because that was very clear, there's a price for that service, you know, mortgage provision, it goes into GDP because there's a service and a price. But net interest payments, what is that? And all of a sudden, they started looking at those numbers, those very numbers I showed you before, and they're like, oh my God, and they called this the banking problem. And by they, I mean the people inside the UN, there was a group called the system, well, inside a, a part of the UN called the Systems of National Accounts, and they're like, we can't not include this massive thing that's actually growing. And obviously there's activity there. And instead of kind of just pausing a minute and doing one of, you know, Kinney's, the physiocrats kind of spreadsheets and trying to understand what's productive, what's unproductive, could it be that actually this big blob is growing, um, not because it's actually contributing to society, but at least part of it potentially, you know, is problematic because it's not actually doing much more than moving stuff around. They just gave it a name. So they called the commercial banks net interest payments financial intermediation and the net interest payments of the investment banks risk taking. And overnight, bang, it goes into GDP. Now it's not, as I said before, the, the point is not to not put it in because somehow it's just value extraction, that would be idiotic. But without any attention 
on what is the form of finance that was growing, what is actually happening in the sector. Is it productive? Is it unproductive? Are there ways to actually reform it? There was very little discussion at the time. This attention just to, we have to, you know, if something has a price, if it's earning income, it must be valuable, just kind of led to this kind of superficial idea, let's just give it a name. And this, you know, was very interesting actually because as soon as finance started to go into GDP and was also seen as a productive part of the economy that was not unrelated to also the ability of the sector to lobby for certain things like deregulation but also that arrogance of, um, of seeing itself as very productive is not unrelated to how we measure things. Sociologists, by the way, call this performativity. How we measure the performance of something then affects how that something behaves, which then feeds back into how we measure it. Um, the governance of organizations, just coming back to this warning um, that Fink and others have given, um, actually for decades, again, as I mentioned, um, about the, sh the risks of short-termism and the risks around really believing that maximization of shareholder value is the only way to govern an organization, so little has changed. And I think this is fundamentally related to the fact we haven't kind of debunked the underlying assumptions behind the value theory of maximization of shareholder value. It's not gonna change if we just say it leads to short-termism, right? That's just the effect. It has to change because we have to say it's wrong. It's the wrong theory of value. And I personally, think it's the wrong theory of value. This is all, by the way, subjective, right? We're not, again, talking about physics. This is economics, this is social science, there's different ideas. So this is, you know, take everything I'm saying in some ways with a grain of salt, but I believe that's true. Um, and the reason is, is that if you look at the textbooks of maximization of shareholder value, there's this underlying assumption that shareholders um, are really the biggest value creators, but specifically the biggest risk takers. So Michael Jensen, writing in the 80s, who kind of was one of the first authors of this approach, called shareholders the residual claimants. So the idea is that everyone else has a guaranteed rate of return. So banks have their guaranteed interest rate, workers will have their guaranteed salary, and at the end, if there's something left over, it goes to the shareholders. So poor babies, they might get nothing, right? And so they risk so much, so they deserve to get these big booties at the end, for example, of some big bubbles like the dot-com bubble, the clean tech bubble today. And what's interesting is that, it, you know, that completely dismisses the fact that that's not true. Um, you know, I, I was here, when was I here, Stuart? Uh, 2013? No, I can't remember. Yeah, uh, presenting my book, The Entrepreneurial State, where basically I talk for whatever amount of minutes you're allowing me to talk tonight, 50 minutes on this massive risk-taking role, actually, of the state. Everything in your phone that makes it smart and not stupid, unless some of you have stupid phones, was funded by the public sector through massive risk-taking. Internet, GPS, Siri, touchscreen display. If you look today at green technology, much of the uh, high uncertain, high-risk, capital-intensive investments have been taken on, at least initially, by different types of public institutions, which then have crowded in uh, private institutions. Which is not to say the private sector doesn't take risks. Of course it does, but we know that. But this idea that somehow only shareholders are the biggest risk takers and have no guaranteed rate of return ignores the fact that for every internet, which was a success, there are six or seven failures. For every Tesla, which received 500 million from the DOE, there's six or seven cylindras that receive the same amount of money. So, you know, what's required is an objective, not a subjective, understanding of what's actually happening in an area and only by giving that attention to production, but widely understood, I'm not talking about production in a deterministic way, can this idea of maximization of shareholder value be um, uh, debunked and potentially reformed. Um, prices of medicines are quite interesting because it's probably the most uh, symbolic, uh, or how do you say, perfect example of this confusion with price and value. When, as I mentioned, the price of the antibiotic, Oh, Goldman Sachs is great. It, it always has these fantastic quotes, right? <laughs> Curing people is not a good business model because then actually they wouldn't buy stuff. Um, so, you know, value-based pricing is literally the idea that, uh, you know, prices of drugs are what the market will bear. So you allow prices to reveal how much people actually want a drug. And I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but it has no, again, objective attention 
to what is actually happening in terms of that division of innovative labor that both Smith, Ricardo, and Marx paid attention to. Um, and it's quite mad uh, or crazy that we allow a system where the taxpayer is putting in every year in this country over 30 billion a year for the research underlying many of these drugs alongside private pharma, it's always alongside, it's not state versus business, and yet somehow the prices are not reflecting that division of innovative labor. So National Institutes of Health Research are responsible for something like 75% of new molecular entities with priority rating, and again, the prices are not reflecting that. Um, now, who owns our data is also an interesting question in terms of the issues around platform capitalism, which is you know, an issue I think quite uh, big here in San Francisco. And what, again, is interesting is that by focusing on, you know, the stories of wealth creation, and so, you know, wealth is created there, and then we just have to tax it. We have to worry about privacy in terms of, uh, you know, the, the tech companies today are either being taxed or being told that there's all sorts of problems in terms of privacy, but they're not being um, really challenged in terms of why do you even have the data in the first place? Um, so again, the division of innovative labor, the collective creation of value underlying much of the digital economy. If you look at it, this idea that sort of wealth creation is there and then you just have to tax that wealth would be dismantled. In Barcelona, in Spain, what they're looking at is how can you change the relationships? So precisely because the technology which is used to retrieve the data has been publicly financed. Again, I've already mentioned internet GPS, but especially the data is of the citizens. Every time you click on something, you are basically producing data. The idea that actually we could fundamentally change relationships instead of just taxing wealth um, is interesting. And so um, the chief digital officer, who I think Tim knows as well, Francesca Bria and the team in Barcelona are thinking about how could we allow actually a public repository of the data to be governed in new ways where the data, when it's generated, goes into the city to improve uh, its public transport. Again, kind of fundamentally changing how we think about value creation in terms of institutions, organizations, and the collective creation of value versus just kind of accepting values there and we're just gonna tax it. Um, role of government, as I mentioned, what's interesting is that we literally, in how we account in GDP, it's impossible to show the productivity of government in that way that Lloyd Blankfein uh, talked about because especially with areas that government produces that are free, like uh, public education, we don't know how to value the quality of the public education, so we only put in the salaries of the teachers, not the value of a well-structured education system. S same thing with the hospitals. The costs of the, of, of, of the doctors and the nurses, not the value that they're producing. But also what's interesting is that the way in which public servants around the world are trained through new public management and public choice theory itself is kind of derived from this notion that I mentioned before, that you know, at best what bureaucrats are doing are just fixing markets or redistributing value through taxation, but are not actually value creators themselves. Um, and this is, you know, again, just kind of a story that has been accepted. But if you actually look, as I've mentioned, sector by sector, but also the big changes that have occurred, including right now worldwide um, kind of attempts at least to battle climate change, there's lots of different types of actors that are making investments, that are reimagining different spaces in terms of clean cities, and using the word value creation only to describe what's happening in business and not even using it to describe the role of the bureaucrat ends up creating this self-fulfilling prophecy that we end up actually getting quite inertial and bureaucratic institutions because we don't even have a way to talk about the role of the state as potentially also value creating. Anyway, what to do? So first of all, I've kind of repeated this idea that you know, markets are outcomes of how public, private, third sector, and other organizations come together, and this really has to be translated into this idea, this real idea, not just within governance structures of organizations, but how they uh, operate in the economy of value as being created collectively. And that, we, we, we simply don't have that in economics. We have production functions where you have, you know, capital and labor and they meet and then output comes about, but we don't really have this attention to how do we look at all the different actors in an economy and how they can together 
create value, and literally use the word wealth creator and value creator for these different entities. Um, which would mean, if we did have that, that we would pay just as much attention to the organizational capabilities and capacities and investments that are being made in all these different types of organizations. That same call for purpose that's required in terms of thinking about long-termism and the reinvestment of um, funds in terms of internal resources is really also important in different types of organizations, including uh, public sector ones. Um, and markets themselves, instead of confusing markets with business, we have to fundamentally understand that markets have, over the course of the last 200 years, um, and can be, actively shaped and co-created. So this idea that at best we are fixing markets really needs to be replaced by an idea of co-creation and co-shaping of markets and get rid of these ideas that we're going to be leveling the playing field in order to get a green transition. We really have to tilt it. But what does it mean to tilt the playing field? Um, you know, does it mean actually picking particular uh, actors in the economy to support? Of course not. But it does mean to really bring that directionality to the fore of the discussion and to kind of transform how we understand uh, market mechanisms. And fundamentally, in terms of coming back to this issue of the production boundary, there, you know, by thinking of co-shaping and co-creation of markets, and not that there's some market actors there, and then we just intervene in the system, it means you know, actively steering certain activities back into the production boundary. Whether that's, oh sorry, I'm looking at the computer instead of the slides here. Um, so, so that means reforming finance, you know, Finance, financing, finance does not have to be the way uh, to organize the financial sector. Uh, Minsky talked about that quite a bit, so did Keynes, um, but we've allowed that. I mean, it's quite mad that we don't have a financial transaction tax. It's not rocket science to realize that that would help us get more long-termism in the economy, and of course, it would have to be a global uh, project. But that's just a policy, but the reason to have that policy really would come about from an understanding that steering activities into the production boundary, but that would require a discussion of value, and instead of just measuring the financial sector by how much it's earning, by really rethinking how can we make it more productive. Similarly, de-financializing the real economy um, in the 19, up until the 1980s, actually, with the uh, laws at the time, the Security Exchange Commission would have actually made it illegal to have the level of share buybacks that we have today. Um, so these are both due to deregulation, but also a lack of real understanding of how to shape markets to actually produce the kind of society that we need. Uh, we've allowed, if you want, the um, economy to become so uh, financialized. I'll just give you one example of, of, of just how different things are. You know, Bell Labs, which I'm sure many people in the room know, uh, was one of the most innovative private sector laboratories inside AT&T, um, actually came about at a time where government was much more confident about these issues. So AT&T was forced to reinvest its profits back into the economy, back into innovation, back into big innovation beyond telecoms, uh, yeah, beyond the telecommunication sector, in order to retain its monopoly uh, status. And so, you know, so that kind of conditionality uh, is, is, is very interesting and creating a much more symbiotic and mutualistic public-private partnership would require uh, uh, talking about issues like this. The prices of drugs, the fact that they don't um, you know, reflect collective efforts, that's not a hard one. We've just written a whole report on that if you're interested, called The People's Prescription and what to do about it. I want to finish with, with just an, an, an example of what it would look like to really form partnerships between what I've been calling collective value creators in the economy to actually really redefine purpose, both within organizations, but also in terms of how they're relating to achieve uh, goals. And, um, and also really question, you know, in many cases, is this just about new types of relationships and policies, or do we fundamentally also need new types of institutions and social innovations around those institutions? Um, Personally, I, I just actually formed a whole department around this kind of thinking with this notion of public pur purpose at the center, so the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose that I've set up at UCL. So just welcome you to interact with us around this because what I'm about to uh, go through with you as an, as, as an example, we're working on um, globally, especially with cities um, and different regions, that are really kind of bringing the notion of purpose to the fore. Um, and one of the things we've been trying to do is really to change the vocabulary. The vocabulary that has, we've sort of accepted um, and almost 
you know, we, I work with policymakers all around the world and this notion that, you know, one actor is de-risking another actor fundamentally is reproducing this value narrative and discourse that value is created in one part and at best you're enabling and facilitating de-risking that value creator. So if we really want to get purpose within different organizations and also use that to tackle big societal challenges together, these kinds of kind of lame words of one actor fixing another one um, and, uh, um, and leveling the playing field and being the lender of last resort, uh, you know, lots of these terms themselves have to be unpicked and reveal the problematic value propositions on top of which they lie. So this, this notion of missions, and, and it's, it's interesting to reflect on this, of course, because it's the 50th anniversary of the Apollo mission, um, this notion of missions, I think, are a really interesting way to kind of unpick purpose um, in both the business sector and the public sector. So just reflect a minute, you know, to get to the moon and back again, which I mentioned before, required real kind of imagination, a goal to be set, but fundamentally dynamic and, in, and economy-wide interactions between different actors to fuel investment and innovation for a common purpose. So there was the challenge, the broad challenge was at the time the space race and Sputnik. The moonshot was very specific, but it required many different sectors to innovate, not just aeronautics, there was nutrition and materials, there was about 12 different sectors. And then what government did was really transform its instruments like procurement and prize schemes and grants to fuel that bottom-up experimentation. So over 300 projects in order to get to the moon, of which many failed. So again, that kind of risk-taking really shared across many different actors, but also you know, bottom-up experimentation also in business in order to reach a common goal. And so what we've been working on is what would it look like actually to really unpick this word purpose in a moment where we not only have a 50th anniversary of the moonshot, but we simply are not even getting any closer to these SDGs. So if you take the 17 sustainable development goals, transform them into concrete missions, which then really require public and private and third sector actors to interact in productive ways, but also in conditional ways. So if you look at the massive amounts of subsidies and guarantees and investments that governments give businesses worldwide, these would become also conditional on businesses transforming themselves and investing in areas with some sort of common purpose. Of course, also with commercial benefit. I mean, this is not about nonprofits. Um, and what's interesting is also that by doing that, it also changes how we think about inclusive growth. Inclusive growth is, not all, is, is no longer this idea of redistribution. You know, there's no, there's, I don't think it's a coincidence that the, um, that the community action in Silicon Valley has liked UBI. It completely reproduces the usual narrative, right? Wealth is created here, oh, and here's a handout to the citizens. Thinking about this co-creation and collective value creation idea, which fundamentally also requires, again, an objective understanding of who's doing what across a whole different innovation space, you know, really kind of begs the question, well, how do we make sure that we're not just socializing risks, but also socializing rewards? And I already mentioned one way to do that is conditions on reinvestment, which would also <clears throat> tackle the two problems that I talked about at the beginning, those two twin faces of financialization, but also, you know, there's other ways to also have conditionality. One of the things which you might know is currently a big problem is the way that intellectual property rights and patents, which there's nothing wrong with patents, but how we've allowed them to evolve in ways that are very problematic. So patents are too upstream in the innovation chain, so we're actually patenting the tools for research. They're too wide, we're allowing them to be too, too much used just for strategic reasons. They're too strong, so hard to license. We could actually make strong conditions attached to those kinds of um, uh, areas which can be redesigned and reshaped in this market co-creation, market shaping kind of mentality, but as a condition also to have a 20-year monopoly. Um, I mentioned this you know, example with Tesla and Solyndra. What's interesting is that what Obama said to Tesla was if you don't pay back the loan, we get three million shares in your company. And why you would want three million shares in a crappy company that doesn't pay back its loan is kind of beyond me. He had all the Goldman Sachs guys working for him in the White House. They could have at least come through then. Um, and had he, taken, had he taken three million shares when the loan was actually paid back, the price per share went from nine to 90. 
um, and that would have more than covered the Solyndra loss in the next round of investment. But that's not just like a strategic point, that requires that kind of level of confidence of you in the economy being an active co-creator and market shaper and not just a regulator. And what's also interesting with Obama when he did the Affordable Care Act and he was accused of meddling in people's health care, at best he gave a social democratic uh, uh, answer. I know in America you don't use the word social democratic, but that's what he did. He said, well, this is the right thing to do. There's 60 million people uninsured. What he should have said was meddling? What are you talking about? You know, again, 75% of drugs are actually funded by the state. Of course, we have the right to make sure they actually get to the citizens. And, but that requires, again, a different discourse, narrative, vocabulary of you as a public entity also creating a space, not just intervening, not just regulating. And this is what I'm, you know, the reason I put that quote by Plato before, storytellers rule the world, it kind of is, you know, it's really true. The stories we are telling, first of all, they're just stories. The economy is a story. I, I loved how you finished the, the, the or sorry, the, the, the guy who did the video, right? He said, this is just something we've made up. And, you know, partly that's true, partly that's not true with money. But the point is, we can fundamentally change the system. And it will be very hard to change if we don't debunk the ideas of where value creation comes from. And in the end, I think this is a very hopeful story because we do, as I said, have a real opportunity. This is a moment where there's lots of discussions, not only about purpose, but about directionality. You look around the world, there's talk about inclusive growth, sustainable growth, innovation-led growth. Many economies, like the UK economy, continue to be driven by consumption-led growth. So the ratio of private debt to disposable income is back to what it was just before the crisis. And that was the cause of the crisis. Um, and so there's you know, this desire, as I said at the beginning, for change. And if we don't bring back the debate about value, and this isn't about which value theory is right or wrong, but the debate and contest the idea that some actors are value creators and some are just redistributors or facilitators or enablers, it's going to be impossible to change the system. So that's my call for action, and I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Kind of a long now question. That was fantastic, thank you. Um, and I sort of raised it at the beginning. You, you said that value becomes, comes partly out of taking a collective perspective on things. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there's also a kind of a long now perspective on things. You've had some discussions with Brian Eno, who was one of the founding directors of this organization. And uh, just the fact that the entrepreneurial government sort of takes on things that, the, these kind of long-term risky dives into science, into innovation, uh, that companies would not usually do, because they can't, it's just too long-term for them to, especially as a startup, to take on. And is there a long now angle to the rethinking of value that you want to make happen? So, First of all, I don't think, so this isn't about the state mm -hmm. as a thing in itself, like there's the DNA of a state as somehow long-term. Many states, many state institutions, public organizations are actually very short-term, mm -hmm. right? Because of the electoral cycle, for example, mm -hmm. or because of the self-fulfilling prophecy of That's not what the deep state is for, is to get past those election cycles. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so there really is a self-fulfilling prophecy that unless we you know, explicitly talk about value creation amongst different actors, and I would include there, I mean, I mentioned trade unions. Do trade unions create value? My God, we wouldn't have the weekend <laughs> without trade unions. We wouldn't have the eight-hour workday without trade unions, and yet we don't use the word value creation for what labor unions have given to us. So, you know, I'm from Italy, so, you know, the state you know, when, when my African friends say, oh, Mariana, you're talking about these things, we just have so much corruption, we can't, I was like, it's corruption. We taught you, you know, I taught, we taught <laughs> Don't even try it. We did that better than you. Um, so there's so many problems with, you know, the public sector, as there are with the private sector, but whereas the private sector has had a real internal, you know, well, first of all, they 
go to do MBAs, you know, where you do strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior. It's all about thinking out of the box. Mm -hmm. That same level of ambition is often not had in the public sector, but that is not unrelated to how we think about value. That's sort of the point here, okay. right? In the entrepreneurial mm -hmm. state, I just kind of talked about what the state does. But we shouldn't forget the state also does a lot of bad things when it's long-termist. It's not just, th this isn't a normative point. The point is when you do accept that you're a value creator, you also have to ask, what am I creating? So fracking was basically government financed. We only worried about it after the fact. And so when you admit this value creation process, it's not just a rosy picture, it also should create more tension, more debate, more contestation, more democratic potential in terms of citizens also being aware um, and questioning what's being created. Um, and what was interesting is that because we don't admit that the state is, or at least in, 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 in common places, we don't kind of talk about the state as value creator, that was not unlinked to the fact that we didn't actually talk about fracking ex ante, we just talked about it ex post. Mm -hmm. And I think most people wouldn't even today know that fracking was basically government financed. Um, and so what, what is required is a real, when I say co-creation, and th this example of the missions, the first question is, well, who decides what the mission is? Is it a top-down kind of Kennedy kind of thing? Or do we really rethink, in this opportunity to rethink capitalism, the new ways in which we can get real civic engagement, even in framing missions in the first place? And in Germany, where they've recently had their Energiewende policy, which is in no way perfect, but what was interesting was that it would never have happened without the green movement bringing sustainability to the fore. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions we should ask is, do we even have the capacity within governments to welcome the engagement with movements mm -hmm. in framing kind of this purpose? Um, and that is important, I think, for government agencies, but you need the capability to do that. To do that. We need empathy 101 kind of classes. Speaking of green, I gather you've had some interaction with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, mm -hmm. OEC, and the Green New Deal. Um, what's your perspective on her and, and it? Um, so I've been talking to her for about a year and a half, mm -hmm. um, so before she was elected. Um, Hmm. And I think she is, I mean, as a person, we can talk about her, but she's ex extremely bright. She listens. She's mm -hmm. interacted with lots of different people. I think also others in this room that I know she's talked to. Um, and I think what's really interesting mm -hmm. with the Green New Deal is that it's, as, as I mentioned, it's not just about renewable energy, right? It really is about greening an economy. I do think there's a bit of danger, though, putting everything in the pot, in the mm -hmm. soup. Um, so I think it's very smart to not, you know, to talk about the way that we need a greening of every sector. I already mentioned, I think before, I think I mentioned, I can't remember, you know, like in Germany, the steel sector has reduced its material content through repurpose, reuse, and recycle. That was actually a condition for the kind of loans it was getting from its public bank. So really understanding you know, a, a, a green transformation of our entire economy, but that's separate from, I think, Medicare for all. I mean, that's a really ambitious redistributional policy, and it's very important to put it in a kind of a New Deal perspective, but putting everything under the Green New Deal potentially makes it also messy and gives an excuse for kind of not getting it done because it just becomes, you know, such a big kind of uh, challenge. So all these different policies are definitely interrelated. Mm -hmm. Also, because if you have proper redistributional policies, you're also potentially doing, especially if they're designed well, what Amartya Sen talks about, which is he says we can't actually thrive and flourish as a society unless everyone has kind of basic opportunities and capabilities. And, you know, UBI is, is sometimes trying to frame things like that, but the problem with UBI is, again, as I mentioned, it's, it doesn't debunk the narrative of kind mm. of the handout. I'm much more interested in a universal basic kind of dividend or citizen's share um, because it just gives that agency to citizens as having created value and getting, you know, a share of what they've created versus a handout from the wealth creators in some other part of the economy. So but one, I think the Green New Deal is very ambitious. One version of the <clears throat> carbon tax that's been proposed is a sort of a universal uh, basic uh, share with the idea that that particular tax would basically be divided by the number of people in the nation that has that tax and everybody gets that uh, piece. Is that the kind of thing that might make sense in the terms you're talking about? Um, in terms of a carbon tax? Carbon tax. I mean, a carbon tax is different from... I mean, no, I'm thinking more... Um, I mean, so this is interesting because how you design a policy really matters. So, mm. you know, I mean, the universal basic income is, first of all, 
one of the reasons I think it's problematic is that we already have something called universal basic services or in countries with proper welfare states, we do. Mm -hmm. um, so, sorry, the US is <laughs> a bit barbaric on that sense. But, you know, the degree to which UBI or, or I don't, I've, I've never heard the carbon tax being framed in terms of universal income. Actually, it's, income. It's, it's come up a number of times okay. that that would I've be the most that. equitable thing to do with a carbon tax is that basically everybody gets a stake. Okay, it, I, I haven't heard that. In a okay. shockingly equal way. Right, okay. I mean, what's interesting is also what's happening in France now with the, with the yellow jackets. And I think okay. one, you know, just coming, bringing back the you know, notion of the Green New Deal and what it means also for the taxation system and who actually benefits more or less or if it's going to be, mm -hmm. you know, something that's very interesting that's happening with the trade union movement is this idea of the just transition. Mm -hmm. That when you actually transition from mm -hmm. a fossil-based economy to a greener one, there's going to be lots of people left behind. Mm. Um, and also the taxation that they introduced in France, you know, there was a real resistance to it. And this is what I mean by, you know, if, if we don't fundamentally redesign the system itself and the institutions and the kind of stakeholder engagement, it's going to be really hard to change things. So the fact that trade unions haven't been really at the table defining the green transition, hmm. but are just worried about it post facto and trying to defend workers who are going to be mm -hmm. potentially left behind is part of the problem itself. Mm -hmm. And so having a real stakeholder governance, not only of organizations, because there is that whole debate and the varieties of capitalism, stakeholder versus shareholder, maximization, but literally how we engage as a society to even define the kind of ambitions that we have ahead, bringing labor back to the table ex ante and mm -hmm. having a real discussion. It's not just trade unions, but you know, different voices to the table to define these big shifts. That's, I think, one of the biggest challenges we have. There, you know, populism is, you know, there's all sorts of different causes behind it, but people really feel that they have been left behind. You know, globalization, technology, it's not affecting many people's lives. And so how we can bring, you know, make politics matter, show that policies matter, designing proper policies matter to people's daily lives, also requires them to be at the table when we're talking about the missions so themselves. What, what other politicians, active people in politics, besides a, a young new congresswoman from the Bronx, uh, who's paying attention to you? Are any of the presidential candidates uh, aware of what you're putting out, like Elizabeth Warren, or is it anybody in Britain? Or who, yeah, who's so Elizabeth Warren, um, she invited me back in, when was it, 2016, to give evidence to the Senate around this issue of pharmaceutical pricing, and we've been in contact over the last month. Hmm. She has a, a bill out on that. Mm -hmm. I met with her team, actually, just two weeks ago. Hmm. Um, in, the U, in Europe, I mentioned this document on missions. It's actually now become law. So it was a report I had the honor to write for the competition, sorry, for the Innovation Commissioner, Carlos Modas, a Portuguese commissioner for the European Commission. So they have 100 billion euros in the Horizon program to fund innovation. It sounds like a lot, but it's not if you divide by European GDP. Um, and the missions concept was voted on, so it's now a legal instrument through which part of the Horizon program will be managed. So the idea is that instead of just kind of blabbing about challenges, it becomes something very concrete through which you use the innovation uh, mm -hmm. budget to kind of focus on 10 or 15 missions that require, though, many different sectors across Europe and then those bottom-up experimentation. So that's now law. Um, in the UK, what we did was we used it also to rethink the industrial strategy. As I mentioned, industrial strategy across the world has come back after being a blasphemy for quite a few decades, but the risk is it just becomes a list of sectors. So in the UK, in recent years, there was a list of five sectors, automotive, aerospace, financial services, creative industries, and life sciences. Um, and our point was, no, don't do that. That's when you get captured very quickly by having a mission-oriented industrial strategy. You set problems and challenges that society faces and use all your different sectors to tackle those together. And similarly, in Scotland, How would advised... you state that mission? Sorry? Or how would you state that mission? Instead of those sectors, how should the mission be stated? Well, so what the government then did was it chose, and we were actively kind of informing them, for mm -hmm. broadly defined challenges, and there were mm -hmm. clean growth, future of mobility, healthy aging, and the opportunities around AI and big data. That was a strange mm -hmm. one, because that's more of a <coughs> general purpose technology, not so much a challenge. Mm -hmm. And so once they've set those four challenges, and that was done, you know, basically 
through the government. That's why we have elected democracies. The idea mm. was then that they engage very actively with different stakeholders to make each one of those broadly defined challenges into a set of missions that again would require all these sectors, not a list of just four or five. Right. Um, and AI, by the way, I think is always a cross-cutting one across any uh, mission, whether it's health or future mobility. But just lastly, in Scotland, when I talk about new institutions, this idea that you know, we need more finance, there isn't enough finance for whether it's SMEs or the SDGs, that's false. There's plenty of finance, it's often just impatient finance. Even venture capital is very impatient. You know, three to five years, they want to exit through an IPO or a buyout that created huge problems for mm -hmm. sectors like biotech. So what we often need is long-term committed strategic capital, and this is why some countries have set up public banks. Hmm. So I'm an advisor for Nicola Sturgeon, advised her to set up a public bank, but said, be careful, don't turn this into a handout machine, right. so that whichever business or sector shouts the loudest, mm -hmm. make it a bank that actually provides that patient long-term finance to those organizations that are willing to engage with you in your um, societal missions. Patient finance alone is a revolution there. Mm -hmm. um, related is a <laughs> question from Brian Schulman. Among economists, to what extent is there a consensus that the house is on fire? Um, in terms of how Greta uses it, so well, the kind of climate. Of, you say yeah. there's basically, um, it's in, in trouble. I mean, the problem is that there's this, if the question is amongst economists, mm -hmm. there's a lot of kind of introspection about economic theory, where it's gone wrong, and there's a movement really uh, about rethinking economics, and there's a bit of a danger there because economists love to show how mathematical and scientific they are compared to, you know, the sociologists and the anthropologists. And, the, still, yeah. right? and, and, and so, unfortunately, part of the rethinking economics movement has kind of bought into that and is trying to make economics more user-friendly. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea is there's too much math, we need to make it much more about kind of real life. And the problem is that it's not too much math, it's the wrong math. It's math from Newtonian <laughs> physics. And it's all about you know, equilibria and unique equilibria and averages matter and the representative agent. There was all sorts of other mathematical tools that could have been used, for example, from biology. In fact, lots of the agent-based modeling today, but that's kind of ghettoized in economics. Mm -hmm. It's not out there at the mm -hmm. center. Um, uses more kind of metaphors and, and um, mathematics from biology, but also my thesis actually was using um, replicator dynamics. So, hmm. you know, distance from mean dynamics. Um, in economics, we assume averages. So if you, you know, in biology, you couldn't explain change if everyone looked the same, right? Distance from mean, you show your growth by how different you are from me, how different mm -hmm. your fitness is. And yet this focus on averages and representative uh, mm -hmm. uh, actors in economics is, is fundamentally different from how, you know, growth and change is looked at in other sciences. And so I think what's really important, and this is what I, I guess I was trying to do also in the book, is to kind of, kind of to debunk the assumptions underlying the models mm -hmm. versus to say, you know, get rid of the math. Um, but in terms of the house being on fire with climate change, unfortunately, and this is my point about just seeing it as patching up different types of market failures, it's not that we don't need the carbon tax. Of course mm -hmm. we need carbon taxes, but you know, not really seeing the green mm -hmm. transition and the green revolution that's required as an active market co-creation and market shaping process across that whole system is a lost opportunity. We should remember that big revolutions in the previous um, waves of technology, for example, mass production, would never have had the effect that they did across the whole economy without also really bold demand side policies. So suburbanization was fundamental to the power of mass production mm -hmm. to really affect production, distribution, consumption, and productivity. Mm -hmm. And what we need today is the equivalent of these kind of demand side policies like suburbanization, but in a green direction. And we're not really getting that, except in some isolated cases. So here's another, in a sense, national policy question from Kevin Kelly. Can we learn anything about reforming capitalism from China? Right. So, you know, my previous book was called The Entrepreneurial State. And when I think mm -hmm. of China, I think of the adaptive state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, China, really interestingly, I think, is learning from the U.S. in a moment that the U.S. is unlearning mm -hmm. from itself. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it struck me that the first thing Trump did when he came into office was actually attack particular public organizations, ARPA-E and PBS. <laughs> um, and what China's been doing, you know, and, and I think there's a question on whether it's going to be successful or not, is forming actually quite active and 
fester kind of innovative uh, uh, public organizations, but they're huge, they're huge. It's not a decentralized network of public organizations across the whole innovation chain as we had in the US. So the Chinese Development Bank is a massive financial institution which has provided loans up to nine billion for many of its companies, including Huawei. Huawei wouldn't exist without the Chinese Development Bank. By the way, Huawei, which is in the news a lot, is a cooperative. Can you believe that? In, hmm. in, they, uh, it was quite fun. Oops, God, sorry. Um, in Dalian, I, I met, um, I, we, they had a tea ceremony in Dalian, uh, China, because the World Economic Forum has a youth component that meets in Dalian. And, the, and Huawei executives asked me and three other economists, this was back in, I think, 2013, to meet with them to say, what should we do about the US? Hmm. It was very strange, I mean, thinking about what's happening now. And we we're like, what do you mean? They're like, well, yeah, it's really hard in the US. It's, we're, 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 we're not really penetrating the market. And my advice was, tell them you're a cooperative. <laughs> I mean, just in terms of kind of getting, you know, what I think is interesting in China is there's a lot of variety. There's not one model. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different types of organizations, hence the Huawei example. It's a cooperative. There's state-owned companies. There's companies that are actually going more towards, slowly, I think, a more market-driven um, kind of Anglo-Saxon model almost. Um, but there's variety there. There's also much more meritocracy in terms of who works in government than we have in many countries. In the UK, there's very little meritocracy in terms of who actually rises up in government. Um, there's lots of experiments actually at the community level, but it is also, you know, it's, 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 you know, has problems of democracy. So it's not, it's not one, you know, it's not a cut and paste uh, model from, you know, communist versus capitalist, but how it evolves the degree to which there is engagement. You know, for example, they're spending 1.7 trillion on greening their economy, coming back to the green missions. Mm -hmm. um, and this is out of urgency. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting how also in the US, big things happen when there is urgency, you know, when there's war. I don't know if you've seen also the uh, documentary on the Roosevelt's, it's fantastic. When there was urgency, mm -hmm. big things happen in the US. And so the degree to which this urgency creates because of pollution is creating both a very positive mm -hmm. Change so 1.7 trillion on greening the economy, including energy-friendly technologies, not just renewable energy, but also kind of that rush to create and invest and in, and in, in not focus on really rebalancing the whole economy. For example, around consumption and services, is is causing the economy to be unbalanced. Three questions uh, relating to sort of organizations and governance. Catherine Fulton, who you met upstairs. Can you give me an example of an organization with the kind of governance structure you would like to see? Amelia Evans asks, how specifically would you reform corporate governance so it creates value? And William Petrie asks, lean, mag lean manufacturing, which is a val very value-focused movement, uh, was rejected by American business culture. What can we learn from that failure? What was the last one, sorry? Uh, lean manufacturing uh, was basically, it was very value focused, was rejected by American business culture, says William Petrie. And can we, what do we learn from failures like that? Mm -hmm. um, so the first one around uh, public organizations and, mm -hmm. and how they're structured. So um, I know Tim knows about this. So government digital services in the UK was very interesting because they, basically question why is it that when you need to search the web, even though you're in a government institution, you have to go to Google. Why don't we set up our own, um, you know, our own uh, website? And actually, sorry, the government asked this. And the first thing they did was say, oh, but we're stupid, we're government, so let's outsource it. And they outsourced it to Circo, which is an organization which is basically uh, uh, benefiting from lots of outsourcing of governments worldwide, including, by the way, Obama's insurance program was outsourced to Serco, which is crazy given it was an insurance policy, it wasn't anything else. Um, and, and so, and it failed. They, they charged government a huge amount and produced a really crappy website. And so this group went from the BBC, which is a really interesting public organization because it has had an internal debate about public value, uh, which again is a word that doesn't really exist in economics. We talk about social values and aggregation of all these individual um, value uh, decisions, um, but public value doesn't exist. And this group inside the BBC, had, who had actually been focused around the BBC iPlayer, moved over to the cabinet office and set up government digital services in order to create this website using internal expertise. And the first thing they did was say, we need to reject the current understanding of what citizens are. 
Citizens have been sold to us as kind of clients and customers, but citizens are fundamentally users. And they use this focus on the citizen as user to design the website in not just a user-friendly way, but also in a way that really uh, increased the, the participation and the ease through which citizens were basically interacting with the welfare state. In that process, saved the government billions, I think it was something like five billion, but without focusing on efficiency. So their, their objective was not efficiency, it was really on creating a better system for the user, made it one of the sexiest places to work. So Tech City or Silicon Roundabout was having a hard time to hire uh, some of the you know, best computer engineers. They all, it, it was an honor to work in GDS and they won a big international design award. And it's just a very interesting example to me because it required, you know, again, upsetting and debunking some of the underlying assumptions that had been operating before. Um, the BBC also, as I mentioned, is very interesting because it has always rejected the static notion of what public and private are. So the BBC is always told, just fix a market failure, and if they did that, they would have, at best, just done documentaries about giraffes in Africa and high quality news. Instead, they also dared to go into, you know, to really redefine the market. Again, co-create, co-shape, not just fix, and enter places, uh, areas like um, soap operas and talk shows, but really kind of redefining those, rethinking what it is to make a soap opera. So not Dallas and Dynasty, but EastEnders. So a soap opera about the working class, um, which then crowded in other private actors into that space. And so really being dynamic and ambitious is, is fundamental. And this is why, by the way, that data that I showed before with the NIH mm -hmm. is also problematic. So the National Institutes of Health, yes, they're public and spend huge amounts, over 30 billion, in pharmaceutical research, but why just drugs? They haven't been ambitious enough to really redefine what the market is. Um, so much less is spent on diagnostic surgical treatments and hardly anything on lifestyle. Lifestyle changes need serious research. Shouldn't it just be kind of voodoo and thinking that you can just wear sandals and eat yogurt and do yoga on the beach? You know, we need proper, <laughs> all, all things we all do. Um, <laughs> And so, and, and, and I think that's that, that point that I was making earlier, you know, really being, being ambitious and making these areas also contested, bringing different voices to the table of how to redefine the market. Um, I mean, corporate, corporate value, you know, there's no one number, but what's interesting is, um, you know, it, it's not just about, well, first of all, I mean, just, let's just put out some really obvious things. I mean, paying the living wage, are, you know, that's, it's, it's a no-brainer, reinvesting pr uh, profits in the workforce so that skills themselves remain a dynamic outcome of the investment process itself. But I think this, you know, just looking at it in terms of corporate organization without looking at it in terms of how that organization is interacting with the other actors, I think there's a real opportunity to create metrics which are both internal um, in terms of, like the examples I just gave, but there'd be many others, but also in terms of the relationships. Um, and that does require this concept of stakeholder value to become a way of thinking of the dynamics of the economy itself and actually having metrics for that. Um, there's unfortunately a tendency now in many countries which have been disillusioned with what's happening in business to say, oh, let's just nationalize business, as opposed to rethinking the... So, um, is this, this probably there was a, a question here, here should we real... nationalize Facebook? I, it's oh, well, you... but, sorry, just to finish this point, you know, <laughs> the real issue is what are the conditions attached with business? What are the obligations between business and, mm. you know, for example, in the UK, uh, Branson entered the rail sector with no conditions attached and, in mm. fact, hasn't been making the kind of investments he should be making. That example mm. I gave with Bell Labs before was a condition attached, mm. the conditions that should be attached. And I think we need metrics just as much for that, and that would require metrics that would help us define whether the kinds of partnerships, you know, everyone talks about public-private partnerships, mm. are actually symbiotic and mutualistic or <coughs> parasitic. Um, and any biologist would tell you that you need to do that if you talk about an ecosystem, mm -hmm. what kind of ecosystem. I mean, Facebook, and actually, I, I, I know Tim's thinking quite a bit about this. The question is not the size. It's really, can we actually look at the degree to which, and coming back to productive and unproductive, mm -hmm. some of the activities really are purely kind of rent extraction. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a really important question because just because you break up a company, mm -hmm. you're not necessarily breaking up 
-hmm. the process through which it's being problematic, and I think much more attention needs to be given to that. I don't know if you've um, heard about this. In fact, you should invite her to give a talk here. Shoshana Zuboff's book, uh, Surveillance oh. Capitalism. Okay. You know, looking at, at, at those issues are, are very important in terms of thinking what to do with Facebook. Who are the other economists paying attention to you and that you pay attention to? The other economists? Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, I mean, I, you know, we obviously as a community talk to each other. I think there's sometimes different understandings of, you know, as I mentioned, rent. So if someone like Stiglitz, um, I, you know, he won the Nobel Prize for his model of asymmetric information. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I would have sort of a, a different opinion to him and we talk. I talk mm -hmm. to Joe Stiglitz, I talk to people like uh, uh, Jeff Sachs and Krugman who are all more in the mainstream, mm -hmm. um, but are, would see themselves as progressives. But what's interesting mm -hmm. is there's a huge debate and variety even within progressive economists. It's not as if you just have the mainstream and then the heterodox. Within the heterodox, there's a huge uh, variety. And I think that itself, the really sad thing is that we no longer teach history of economic thought. Mm. Um, it's not only economic history we don't teach, but history of economic thought. And so the appreciation of how many of these questions aren't just about policy, but as I've been saying, these different assumptions that underlie, for example, different theories of value, when we only teach one theory of value and don't even call it value, we call it Econ 101, that has actually hurt even the debate between the heterodox economists. And That's unfortunately, one thing that I've really often critiqued explicitly is that this idea that, you know, austerity is bad, invest in infrastructure, you know, it's like, my God, really? <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we can't just be thinking it's about pouring more money into the system without having a really refined understanding of, you know, what kind of infrastructure. And again, how can we really have that kind of directional push to transforming a system, which is not just building roads and bridges, but having, um, you know, this, this market shaping. And I think many economists that I speak to in the mainstream, one of the things I differ from them the most is this idea of market failure theory. Well, it's a very long now point you're making, the, the history of economics, among other things, the, your slide on how it's changed from century to century, looking at the history sort of gives you permission to think about how is economics gonna change and policy gonna change now at the level that it has changed at various times in history. If you don't look at history, then you assume the present is the world. And, uh, and the law now gives you this <clears throat> understanding that it has changed and how it changed and why it changed and that there was urgency or whatever it may be. That all mm -hmm. then becomes part of the narrative of social license to change again. Yeah. I think but interdisciplinarity is really important. Uh, mm. Economists not only don't read economic history and history of economic thought, they don't really read anything else. They don't read philosophy. They don't read. <laughs> so the top economists, including you know Keynes or someone who I really admire, who was Karl Polanyi, they you know they were historians and philosophers and economists sort of at the same time. And there's a real I think need for that to come back in economics, which again shouldn't though be confused with just take out the maths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this shouldn't be about qualitative versus quantitative. We can still have serious quantitative methods and use different types of methods. But what happened in economics is that instead of saying, oh, look at that interesting problem, hmm, which kind of, you know, which tool am I going to throw at it? Um, what they actually said is, this is what we want to prove. <laughs> you kind of mm. pray to optimal kinds of outcomes mm -hmm. and show that markets are the best possible way to, or mm -hmm. capitalist market mm -hmm. systems and how they define them are the best possible way to organize a system and the best tools the tools that we need in order to prove that point <laughs> are coming again from Newtonian physics. So it's a deeply unscientific method. Mm -hmm. um, we should have lots of different tools, including, by the way, Newtonian physics, but also in terms of our statistical methods, there's lots of different um, you know, possibilities there. There's case studies, deep case studies that we can be using alongside you know, quantitative techniques. And unfortunately, when economics is driven so much by ideology, Mm -hmm. we end up kind of choosing which tool is going to help me prove the point I want to make. And that, that kind of problematic lack of scientific method is something mm -hmm. that needs to be um, challenged. Bring it on. Thank you, Mariana. This is <laughs> <Thank> great. <you. laughs>